Hello, welcome to Hardware Night. I am Tim, and I'm here to present on what can I do with microcontrollers. So one of the most common questions at the hackerspace is, I have an Arduino, what do I do with it? So my goal here is to at least give you the names of things that can be connected to microcontrollers for whatever reason to hopefully inspire people to come up with projects that they can do with the hardware they keep buying and then not knowing what to do with. So who am I and why should you trust me? My name's Tim. I also go by Kiyoshigawa Online. I have a mechanical engineering degree. I have been a founding and active member of several hackerspaces and self-taught myself electronics for over 15 years now. So I do this a lot, but I am self-taught. So if any of you catching me making a fool of myself, please call me out. I appreciate it. That's fair. Um, so, here's the general overview of the class. Uh, I want to tell you what microcontrollers are in extremely general terms. I also want to go over the boring part first is communication protocols. Just because half the things in the next sections reference them, so you need some vocabulary. Then I'll go over input devices that can talk to microcontrollers and finally I'll go over output devices where the microcontrollers can interface with the world. Um, we try to impose a limit of 40 minutes for classes here so if I take more than a minute on any topic someone needs to yell at me. Okay. Um, I, I know this is the <laughs> this is my uh, runway after this start yelling anyway. Uh, where am I going? Um, basically, every slide in this class could probably be its own hardware night presentation. I just want to get vocabulary and general ideas out there so people can start conceptualizing projects. So without further ado, what are microcontrollers? You'll also commonly see it abbreviated as MCU. It is, stands for microcontroller unit. It's essentially a computer on a chip. So there's this super cool picture. By the way, all my pictures are blatantly stolen from image search with no citations. Uh, anyway, this shows the actual die of the chip where that's the silicone. Someone ground off the big epoxy glob that is normally hiding it so you can see what's going on inside. Anyway, it contains a CPU core that does all the processing work, memory, and input-output, what they call peripherals, which are just things that are programmed into the chip that tell it how to toggle pins in certain ways. Um, essentially, it's a way to connect a digital world to the physical world. So, communication protocols, like I said, is the first thing I want to talk about. This is how MCUs talk to each other and other computers. So the first thing I'll talk about is debug and programming protocols. And then after that, I'll talk about various chip-to-chip -chip communication protocols. So there's two main kinds of debug slash programming protocols. So debugging is a way to find out the state of the chip's memory while it's running. And to program a chip means to write some of the read-only memory on the chip. So when the chip turns on, it starts reading at a specific address and says, do these commands based on the chip's instruction set. So programming it just sets the commands that the chip will follow when you turn it on. Um, there are two main protocols for programming chips. You've got JTAG or SWD, and that is most commonly used on newer chips like ARM. Uh, you'll see this 10-pin connector up here, or this 20-pin connector, are commonly JTAG. These also often come in smaller than typical pin spacing. They're 0.5 or 0 0.05 inches apart instead of 0.1 inches apart. ICSP or ISP are more common in older chips, like the 8-bit Atmels that you see on Arduinos. That's this 6-pin or 10-pin header here in the 0.1-inch headers. So how to program the chips is very chip dependent. You'll want to look it up in the data sheet to find out what chip does what. So after you've programmed your chips, there are ways for chips to talk to each other. So the way chips talk to each other physically 
is that pins are just toggled from zero volts to five volts in an agreed upon way that both chips will understand. So you can make up your own protocol any way you want, but there are lots of common protocols that most chips have built in hardware to understand. These are serial, I squared C or TWI, SPI, CAN bus, USB or universal serial bus. I'm sure you've all seen USB devices. That's just another microcontroller communication protocol. Ethernet, you've got Wi-Fi protocols, you've got Bluetooth, radio, and cellular. I'll get into all of these. So the first protocol, the most common one that everybody uses is serial. This allows two-way communication using two digital pins and ground. So you need three wires to use serial to have two chips communicate bidirectionally. It usually shows up on a data sheet as UART or USART. That stands for Universal Asynchronous Receive Transmit. I forget what the S is, probably serial. Um, anyway, one pin will be sending data and the other pin will be receiving data. So it's only two directional between two devices. Um, the way data is controlled is 100% just by bit rate. You send a bit every so many seconds and it just checks the state every so often to see what that bit is. If there's any timing issues, you'll get bad data. So that's serial, it's super common. The next communication protocol I want to talk about is called I squared C or TWI. It stands for inter inter circuit or two wire interface. The reason there are two names for the same protocol is because Philips got so happy after they invented it and tried to get people not to use it unless they paid them and everyone said fine we'll have our own protocol that works exactly the same way with a different name. So depending on who's paid Philips or not your data sheet may say I squared C or TWI. Um, this allows you to have two-way communications, again, using two digital pins and ground, but in this case, it is between many separate devices. Each device will have an address that's typically 8 bits, and you can say, I only want to talk to this device with this message, so a specific device will receive a message even though they're all sharing the same communication protocol. Um, it is very useful for having lots of different chips talk to one microcontroller without using a lot of pins. The next interface I want to talk about is SPI, or the Serial Peripheral Interface. That's the one that just came up in the other room. Um, it, the context of it coming up earlier was that you can use it to talk directly to SD cards if you wire it up to the correct pins. It's much slower than their typical read write rates, but you can use almost full function of, ah, functionality of SD cards with SBI. Anyway, uh, this allows two-way communications using three or more digital pins and ground. So you've got uh, pins for MOSI, MISO, cable select, and ground. These, if you ever see MOSI and MISO, that almost always means you're using SPI. It stands for master out, slave in, or master in, slave out. Not soup. Um, anyway, you also need, for every device on this bus, you need a cable select pin. When that pin is high, the device will receive the commands you send. When it's low, it will ignore all commands on the bus. So you can, like I squared C, use it to talk to many devices, but you need more pins to do it. It also can run faster than I squared C because you don't need to send out address headers and end bytes every time you send a message you can just toggle the cable select pins which is typically much faster. So it's useful for faster communication between lots of chips at the cost of more digital pins. Uh, the wow. next one I will talk about is the CAN bus or controller area network. This is another two-way communication between multiple uh, ECUs is what they call them on there. That's still just uh, Another name for MCUs. Anyway, this uses two wires, ground and power, and you typically find it in cars and other automotive and industrial applications. There's not a ton of use for it in the hobby world. Um, this works best, so the previous protocols, I squared C and TWI, tend to have a... Am I popping? <laughs> 
Okay, sorry. Anyway, um, they tend to have a master controller that talks to a bunch of slave devices, whereas with the controller area network, you can have a lot of independent devices that need to talk to each other, but any one of them can control who's sending messages and where. It has a fairly complicated priority system. You can find out more about it if you want to interact with something that already uses it. I definitely wouldn't recommend it for beginners, but if you're getting into automotive stuff, you're going to run into it. Talk to Hamster. He's really good at counting stuff. Okay. Yeah, talk to Hamster. He knows what's going on. Uh, the next one is USB or Universal Serial Bus. This is another two-way communication protocol that can be shared by many devices. It is the most complicated out of all the communication protocols I've talked about now. Um, the signals actually use specific differential transmission lines, D plus and D minus. So when one goes high, the other goes low, and this helps you weed out noise on the line because there's always a difference, and if there's interference, it applies to both lines at the same rate. So the offset will go up or down, but the difference between the two lines is always the same. Uh, that allows for more data throughput with less noise on the lines. Anyway, that could be a whole class in itself. So um, these are mostly used when you have a microcontroller project that you want to interact with a PC. Uh, or a phone in this case, they're getting pretty sophisticated, Raspberry Pis, things like that. For now, just know that a lot of microcontrollers offer built-in USB support. You will almost definitely be able to find a pre-made driver that does what you want it to do, uh, and venturing outside of that bubble is a very large, difficult concept. So. Just know that if you have a USB device that you've plugged into your computer, you can almost definitely make a similar one with a microcontroller, given enough effort. Um, next up is Ethernet. This is a standard way of sending wired network communications. It consists of up to four bidirectional pairs of I.O. pins. And there are MCUs out there that just come with Ethernet support built in. You'll have to read data sheets and find one that works for you. There's shields you can buy that'll plug into things like Arduinos that do all the heavy lifting. Again, there are 20 people that come to this hackerspace that know more about network packets than I do, so I'm not going to get into it. Just know it's an option for microcontrollers as well. Uh, Wi-Fi is a protocol for sending network packets wirelessly. Again, I don't know much about the packet specifics, but you don't need to because there are a bunch of dedicated chips that do all the heavy lifting for you. Most currently, the ESP8266 and ESP32 lines have all of that built in. There's libraries everywhere. You don't actually have to know how networks work. You can just run the code and it will do the work for you. So if somebody wants to explain how all that works, that's a wonderful topic for a class that I would love to learn more about. But for now, I can just say ping this IP address and they do it. So hooray. So there are other radio transmitters out there that you can connect to microcontrollers. These will transmit digital signals over wireless carrier bands. Uh, there are lots of existing varieties out there. These used to be very popular probably 10 years ago, but since the ESPs have come out, pretty much everyone uses ESPs wherever they can. They do have a few uses that ESPs will not work with, so I want you to know they still exist and people still like them. So typically, these devices will use one of the other communication protocols I talked about to talk to your microcontroller. So if you buy, say, one of these NRF 24L01 boards that runs at 2.4 gigahertz and tends to send serial data, it will just have a serial or SPI interface to your microcontroller. And then you can say, send this serial string over wireless to another NRF 24L01 chip. Um, there's also, in the 315 megahertz range, a bunch of devices. They look kind of like these ones in the middle with the uh, send and receive boards. Uh, 315 megahertz is typically used in RC planes and garage doors. You've also got 433 megahertz, which is kind of the wild, wild west of uh, radio. There's no regulations on that. 
specific frequency so everybody uses it when they don't want to get FCC approval to do something. So there can be a lot of noise on there, but there's also a lot of devices that allow you to send whatever you want over it. Um, these chips are useful where you don't have a network available to use an ESP chip. They probably will end up costing you more because you'll need another microcontroller plus a daughter board though. So trade-offs, but if you're building a cabin in the woods and want a security system that'll call your walkie-talkie while you're out there, this would be a good option. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is cellular network communication. They, people sell boards where you can just stick a SIM card in the thing and it will let you send text, it will let you download internet data, it will let you send audio phone calls over that cellular network. Um, they pretty much only will work if you have a valid SIM card for a carrier, so you'll need to get a prepaid SIM card one way or another to make them functional, but it lets you interact with cell phone networks directly. So if you, again, have a cabin in the woods and you want it to call your phone whenever somebody breaks in, this would be one way that that could happen. Um, so now that's the end of my communication protocols. I'm going to move on to input types for MCUs. So the way microcontrollers receive input is there are a bunch of pins on there. They can get a signal that's a digital on-off that goes from 0 to 3, 3, or 0 to 5 volts, whatever your processor runs at. Or there's analog inputs as well. That'll be on the next slide. So the simplest way to send an input to the controller is to use a switch. And switches are literally everywhere. So you've got all the keys on your keyboard. Each one is a switch. You can have an array of them that could be like a whole piano keyboard is just what, 82 switches. Um, there are velocity sensitive piano keys which get more complicated, but um, you can also have magnetic switches. If you ever look at the buildings you're in, there's usually two little gray boxes or white boxes on doors. That's just a magnet and what's called a reed switch. So every time the magnetic field gets close, it will snap the switch closed and complete the circuit. Uh, they're tilt switches. They come in fancy digital varieties now that use accelerometers, but the old school ones were just a glob of mercury and a piece of glass. And if it tipped the right way, it would connect the two wires that are sticking into the glass bulb. And if it tipped the wrong way, it would be disconnected. So switches are super common and definitely the easiest way to directly send a digital on-off signal into a microcontroller. Um, analog devices are, so only some microcontrollers support these. You'll have to read the data sheet. Most of them will have what's called an ADC or analog to digital converter that they will mention is tied to specific pins. If you're using one of those pins, it will be able to read your voltage from zero volts, the ground of the microcontroller, up to the operating voltage of about 3.3 volts or 5 volts, depending on what your chip is running at. So the most common type is a potentiometer. So anytime you've used a volume knob, that's a potentiometer. It's essentially just a variable resistor. So you have a fixed resistance from the left pin to the right pin and a wiper in the middle that connects part way around. So essentially it does a simple voltage divider circuit. So when you turn it all the way to the left, it'll read zero volts. When you turn it all the way to the right, it'll read 3.3 or 5, depending on what you hooked it up to. That allows you to know the position of a knob from left to right and work with it digitally. There are also linear potentiometers. If you've ever seen like a mixing board with sliders that just go up and down instead of round, it's the same concept, but instead of the resistor being a circle, it's a big long line. You've also got force sensitive resistors and potentiometers. So if you squeeze on it, it will give you a certain resistance depending on where you squeeze it. Um, that is evident in these silly automatone instruments that I've been building things with forever. I replaced that with a digital potentiometer that uh, does the same thing, but is controlled with microcontrollers. Um, also joysticks are a common place where you'll see them. Uh, there's just two potentiometers orthogonal to each other 
on your typical game controller joysticks. So that gives you an X value and a Y value based on the potentiometer positions. Um, moving on, there are also capacitive touch sensors. So these will usually come with their own controller, but you don't have to have ones with their own controller. You can do it yourself. It just takes more code and tweaking to get them to work well. Um, they work by measuring the time to charge. So it's turning the circuit on and seeing how long it takes the voltage to get up to the peak value using an analog input. If you put your finger on the pad, that changes the capacitance of the system, which changes the charging time. So it knows something has poked this pad. Um, these do require analog pins on the microcontroller unless you happen to have one with its own controller board and then that will probably use one of the communication protocols I discussed before. Um, there we go. So another type of input are weight sensors and load cells. So these are made of a material that will change electrical properties when deformed. Typically it will increase or decrease voltage across it if you change its shape. So the typical use phase for these involves buying a load cell as well as an amplifier circuit that's compatible with that load cell. So it will translate the very small voltage you get from changing its shape to the 0 to 5 volts or 0 to 3, 3 that you need for the microcontroller. They come in various weight ranges, so make sure you read the data sheet when you buy them or it may be useless for your application if it's measuring micrograms and you need it to weigh a person. There are these temperature and humidity sensors. These things are everywhere out there. Typically, they will send digital info back to the PC these days, although there's some older models out there that will output the 0 to 3, 3 or 0 to 5 volt signal that uh, an analog pin could read directly. So there, there are also some microcontrollers that have a temperature sensor built in on the chip. You just have to read a register, and it will give you a value for that. There are distance sensors. So whenever you see robots in robot competitions online, they've usually got one of these things on them to avoid hitting walls and things. So there's two common kinds of these. You've got optical distance sensors and ultrasonic distance sensors. The optical distance sensors uh, usually come in IR as well as laser time of flight sensors. So the IR ones, this little black box, it shines out an IR light and there is a IR photodiode that receives the light back and it figures out how far away things are depending on brightness on the uh, time of flight. Ah, sorry, the IR, this kind of black IR sensor. Um, the time of flight laser ones will actually fire off a laser pulse and wait for it to come back to the sensor and count how long it took. And then they know how far away things are based on the speed of light and some math. So. The IR ones, you typically don't want to use them outside because the sun is a big angry IR light bulb that makes a lot of noise and they're very hard to use and find the signal you want compared to the noise of the sun. The laser can work outdoors depending on the type of laser time of flight sensor you buy. Again, read data sheets. They come in various ranges. So you can get an IR sensor that's designed to work from, say, 2 inches away to 12 inches away, or you can get one that's designed to work from, say, 6 inches away to 4 feet away. Just make sure you read the data sheet and know what you're buying, because otherwise it may not work for you. The ultrasonic one sends out a chirp from one speaker and waits to hear the echo of that chirp back in the other speaker. Um, they have a cone-shaped sensor range, so if something is further away, you're more likely to pick up things to the left or right of directly in front of the sensor than if it's closer. They're very general for something is coming far away, but they do work outside or inside regardless of light levels, so they may be the right way to go. They can also annoy your pets. so. If your pet suddenly gets angry whenever you're working on a project, it may be your ultrasonic sensor. Um, um, back t I probably should have put light sensors before I got to the IR distance sensors. But uh, anyway, light sensors come in a variety of types. You've got ambient light sensors. 
the little zigzaggy circular one just outputs more volt or sorry it's a variable resistor essentially that changes its resistance value depending on how much light is shining on it so if you put it in a voltage divider circuit on your microcontroller it kind of works like a potentiometer in a limited range when you buy one the data sheet will say build this circuit and connect it to your microcontroller and then you'll get out useful data so do what the data sheet says um, there are also wavelength specific light sensors so you can have a sensor that picks up exactly 413 nanometers and as long as it's receiving light on that wavelength that will allow current to flow so again the data sheet will tell you how to actually interface that with something useful but they do exist and you can get very specific or broader range light input sensors there are also sensors that will detect RGB color so you can like drop a colored object in front of it and it will be able to tell you this is a red this is a green or this is some individual combination people take these kinds of sensors and hook them up to their monitor so they can tune the colors on their computer to get true color output when they're doing graphic design things like that again it's all very data sheet dependent on a lot of these inputs so make sure you're researching what you get when you get them I'll probably say that another 200 times before this presentation's over sorry <laughs> Okay, so next we have microphones and piezoelectric sensors. These turn vibrational energy into voltage. They work very similarly to the load cells, but uh, in the case of the microphones, you'll typically see they call them little setret microphones are the round silvery thing with a normally black fuzzy end on it. Those will measure vibrations in the air, aka sound. Um, you've also got piezoelectric microphones where if you place it on a table and then knock on the table, the vibrations will travel through it and generate a voltage there. These will typically need some kind of amplifier circuit. A lot of them you can buy with the circuit attached to them or you can build your own. Um, either way, they probably aren't just plug and play with a microcontroller without some kind of uh, interpreter circuit to get it into that zero to five volt range that you need to pick up things there. On to accelerometers. So these are able to measure acceleration using physics magic and send the info digitally or very rarely ancient ones would send it over analog to a microcontroller. So there are teeny tiny gyroscopes in some of the nicer ones there are other ways to cheat things using magnetic fields and all kinds of other magic but uh, they typically come in either three axis or six axis designs so you've got an XYZ acceleration vector as well as roll pitch and yaw so that's kinda rotating around each of the XYZ axes um, these are often used in things like game controllers so when you're playing with your PS4 controller and you tilt it and the game is aware of that it's using an accelerometer that's in there. The way they're able to do that in any situation is while you're on the surface of the earth gravity is always providing an acceleration vector towards the center of the earth at 9.8 meters per second so there's a clear this way is down indicator always on with accelerometers. Um, Okay, moving on. There are encoders. These are used for things that basically serve the same function as a potentiometer would on an, an, ah, on an analog input, but they're entirely digital. So what you've got is a switch in a shaft that as you rotate it will change the state of two or more pins. So you've got essentially a strip that goes from dark to light over and over again with a light sensor on it and when it's dark a pin will be low when it's light a pin will be high and essentially because it's going dark light dark light dark light you know how quickly the shaft is rotating around there can also be physical hardware switches where there's just a brush on there and it touches one leg and then it touches the other leg connectively around there so whenever you've got like a 
radio knob that you turn and it just keeps turning forever and doesn't hit an end stop, that's almost always an encoder instead of a potentiometer. Um, you can have various protocols for how the pins tell you what direction you're going, how far you've gone. Um, quadrature encoding lets you know every time you take a step and what direction you're going in. There are absolute encoders that usually cost a fortune for high resolution, but that will tell you exactly where on the circle you are. No matter what other input has been received, it will always tell you you are at this many degrees from the origin position every time. Um, I go into a lot more depth on my video game controller class that's up on YouTube if you want more information about encoders. But this is a way to get knob inputs digitally if you don't have analog pins available. Um, there are gas and air quality sensors. These can measure particulates in the air. It's super chip dependent. There's some that are just general, hey, your air's kind of dirty. There are others that are this particular chemical is present in your air and only this chemical is what I care about. So read data sheets. There are generic ones available with breakout boards. It's kind of fun to play around with these. Um, smoke detectors are a common example, but those typically have expensive sensors with radioactive isotopes in them. So harder to get unless you just buy a smoke detector and harvest them. Anyway, uh, there are also digital barometers and altitude sensors. So these typically work by measuring air pressure. So if you want to get good readings, don't put them in an enclosure box that's sealed. Um, they are, again, chip dependent as to how they talk to your microcontroller, but they can be useful for weather stations or RC aircrafts if you're tracking data on things like that. Um, wind speed sensors is another common one that you'll see all over the place. So typically these are just a rotational measurement, either an encoder or a potentiometer that is connected to some cups that blow in the wind. So you can tell how hard the wind is blowing by how fast the cups are moving. Um, you can buy these sensors just as is. They usually come prepackaged and will have a communication protocol port on them. Uh, again, read specs. Um, there are water and moisture sensors. If you're into gardening, you can buy these things, stick them in the ground, and it will say, hey, the earth is dry, I need to water my plants. And when we get to outputs, you'll find ways to actually have the microcontroller turn on the water for you, but not there yet. Um, typically, the moisture sensors will come with a PCB that's calibrated to them. You can make your own. It's just hard to get good data out of it without running a lot of tests. So I highly recommend getting one with a board that's well reviewed if you want to go down this road. So then we've got motion sensors. So these can be used to detect motion, obviously. Um, they usually have knobs on them that allow you to adjust exactly where they're looking. Um, they, you can typically say, make this look in a wider area or a narrow area or angle it up or down, things like that. Um, sometimes it's just a simple light with a light sensor. So like your garage door trip sensor is just one side shining a light and the other side seeing if that light is hitting it. And if you step in front of it, that will turn off the sensor receiving and let the garage door opener know that someone's about to get crushed. Um, PIR sensors, I forget what P stands for, but IR is obviously infrared. Um, they detect changes in heat. So they're looking at an area and if something suddenly gets warmer or colder, it will trigger a controller on the board to send a signal. Sometimes they'll use communication protocols, other times it's just a digital signal every so often whenever it detects motion. Um, there are flame sensors. I found these while I was researching this. I've, yeah, I've never actually used them, but apparently they are designed, you point IR somewhere, and if it sees a flame, the specific uh, IR frequencies and a pattern, then it will alert you only if something is on fire, in theory. I've never actually used these, it just seemed neat, so. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
yep. No, and I honestly never used them. I just thought it was neat, and they're for sale everywhere. So your mileage may vary, but it may be fun to set things on fire and see if you can tell. Um, there are a bunch of biological sensors out there. I haven't done a ton with this. I know Nunu in the other room has some of these uh, EKG pads that you can stick on your brain and get analog signals out of them. Or I guess your skull would be more accurate. I don't think he's cut open his head. Um, there are also heart rate sensors, which are usually just light sensors that can see the change in the color of your skin as your blood pulses, and then it counts your pulse from that. Um, typically, you'll just have an LED and a sensor right next to it for a heart rate sensor, and then it will need some software to interpret it. So. Um, another fun type of sensor are Hall effect sensors. These can detect magnetic fields. There are a lot of varieties of them. There are some that just say a magnet was here and will turn on. There are others that will tell you exactly what direction and how strong a magnetic field is. Yeah, reed switches are literally just a piece of magnetic material, and when it's magnetized, it will snap closed because it's near other things, and when you move the magnet away, it unsnaps because metal is springy, and the magnetic force was stronger than the springiness. With these, it's an actual uh, physics kind of thing. It works similar to a transistor where you can get an analog output depending on the position of the magnet relative to it. So in high-end joysticks, they almost all use Hall effect sensors instead of potentiometers because there's no physical part to wear. It's just a magnet far away. Oh, I did not know that. Apparently the ESP32 has a Hall effect sensor built into it. So that's new to me. I'm just learning about those. Thank you for that wonderful information. But yeah, um, you can also use these for motor speed sensing. If you put a polarized magnet on the end of your motor shaft, it will never physically touch anything, but the north-south swapping back and forth can be picked up by the Hall effect sensor to give you an idea of the speed of the motor. Um, another type of input are cameras. These almost always have their own control boards and will take a picture, process it, and then spit out a string that's just a JPEG that you need to deal with. So. For things like an 8-bit Arduino, cameras are difficult to use effectively because you don't have a lot of processing power or storage space. But for things like Raspberry Pis, you can then feed it to image recognition software and have a grand old time. So they exist. Um, I, too big a topic to get into how to use them effectively. But they could be fun depending on what you're trying to do. Um, there are current or voltage sensors. This whole time I've been saying you need to convert everything to give you a signal from 0 to 3.3 or 0 to 5 volts, but you can also just buy a chip that will sense in the range you want to and send that data digitally back to you. So you can buy chips that will take up to 480 volt or whatever your goal is and use that to get a reading, digitize it, and then use your microcontroller from there. Uh, again, very product specific, check data sheets, but they do exist. There are touch screen displays. So these are usually a glass panel on a screen. Sometimes you can buy them and it's all in one. But if you get down to brass tacks, you take it apart, there's still a sensor panel over a screen of some kind. So there are two main types. You've got resistive and capacitive. Unless you're building your own controllers, it doesn't really matter which one you get. People tend to like capacitive more for indoor, non-weather running into environments because it's more responsive. But if you get it wet, it will screw everything up forever. Well, not forever, but it's very easy to get a lot of bad data from a capacitive sensor that has a drop of water on it. Um, that's why if you've got a waterproof phone and you actually try to use it in a pool, it will never work. <laughs> um, resistive sensors are a bit more finicky than capacitive usually, but they can work if you've got the right setup. Some older ones, like I think all of our giant touchscreen TVs here, will shine lights from one side and have sensors on the other side so they can figure out when people are poking them. 
those aren't as common these days unless you're in this hacker space and we have three giant TVs using that technology. Um, almost always when you buy a touchscreen, it will have its own controller software. So there's just some communication protocol back to your chip where you poke it and it says, I sense to poke at this position. It makes it very easy to use these as long as you buy one with a control board. Um, there are other MCUs can be an input for a microcontroller. So if you buy a GPS module, nine times out of ten, that will have a dedicated chip that just handles interpreting GPS and will send you relevant position data, what satellites you're talking to, etc., over communication protocols. I've seen people try to build their own, but it is not an easy task because the timing required to get it right is very, very precise. Uh, most people that do that move on to FPGAs, and that's a whole ballpark outside of what I'm trying to go over today. So the cell phone modules I mentioned earlier are usually run by their own microcontroller, and you just send them commands over serial for how to interface with them. There are Bluetooth dongles that you can buy uh, cheap from China. These are like 40 cents a piece that will send Bluetooth serial to each other and they communicate with your chip through a serial device and have their own microcontroller. You can also build your own microcontrollers to act as slaves using communication protocols and have a bunch of remote sensors on a network that all talk back to a master controller that interprets those and decides what to do with them. So, um, And again, any combination of the above will work. The important things when you're trying to combine a bunch of sensors together is to read your data sheet and figure out what the pins on your microcontroller can actually do. So you make sure you have enough analog inputs for what you're trying to sense. You make sure you have enough SPI pins, serial pins, I squared C pins to talk to all the chips you want to talk to. If you don't, you can get multiple microcontrollers that will run subsets of your code and talk back to a central source like I just mentioned. But again, the data sheet's your best friend in determining exactly what a specific microcontroller is capable of. So now that you know all the things it's possible to use as inputs, you can take all the information you just gathered about temperature and weather admirals on fire <laughs> and use it to interact with the physical world. Depending on how much you like admiral, you could squirt him with water to put the fire out or you could, uh, I don't know, film it and put it on the internet. <laughs> Sorry, I just singled you out because you're in front of me. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, I will go over in this order. You've got direct output, which is just digital signals and ways to amplify those digital signals to control other things. So you've got relays, transistors, and switches. Then I'll get into lights and displays as well as screens and meters and these will take digital information and turn it into something you can see with your eyes. There are also motors, solenoids, electromagnets and galvanometers or galvos as they are commonly called. Those are fun. Uh, you'll see in a minute. And that takes again digital information and turns it into motion and lastly, there are speakers and buzzers, which will take digital information and turn it into sound or vibration. So we are going to say direct outputs. Again, you've got simple digital, set the pin to 3.3 volts or ground or 5 volts or ground. You can tell a pin to turn on or off. Typically, microcontroller pins have very limited current output driving capabilities. On most modern ARM chips, you can't output more than 2 to 10 milliamps per pin, depending on the chip you have. So uh, the next slide will cover how to get around that problem. But another way microcontrollers work is PWM, or pulse width modulation. And that essentially tells a pin to toggle itself on and off very quickly a certain percentage of the time. So if you set it to a PWM value of, say, 1 out of 255, it would be on one tick and off for 254 ticks. If you set it to 127, it would be on 127 and off 127. So you can effectively get a fake analog output from a PWM pin. 
It works great for things like LEDs, not so much for things like sound. The way to deal with the sound problem is to buy a microcontroller that has what's called a DAC. It's the opposite of an ADC. Uh, DAC is usually how it's pronounced, and that stands for Digital to Analog Conversion. This will allow you to output an actual analog value. There's a lot of variation in the quality of these. Some of them just take a PWM output, stick a capacitor on the end, and hope it's good enough. Other ones will actually drive a neat signal through an amplifier so you can use it directly on a speaker if you want. Um, again, data sheets are your best friend in determining if the DAC on your chip will be good for you. You can also buy off-board chips that specifically do DAC stuff if your microcontroller doesn't handle it. That may be easier than finding an all-purpose microcontroller with a good DAC in it. Um, there are also uh, all the communication protocols I mentioned. Most microcontrollers have a hardware protocol that supports those. So if you see on the data sheet that these pins support UART, you can write directly to registers on the chip and it will take care of sending all the bytes or bits at the correct baud rate for you. You don't have to count the number of microseconds it's been and swap the bits yourself. It uh, makes communicating with other chips very useful if your chip has hardware that supports it. Nine times out of ten you will be able to find a library either from friendly people online in the case of Arduino platforms or from the manufacturer of the chip in most cases that handles all the day-to-day -day send this specific information over this protocol type stuff. So you just install their library, say, send this message, and it'll take care of the rest for you. Um, the, again, everything's very chip specific. So that's what you can do with the pins directly. Then, if you want to drive, say, a 30 milliamp LED off your pin, but it's only rated for two, you can start using transistors. So. In the context of what I'm talking about here, transistors are essentially just ways to take a small signal and make it run a bigger signal. It essentially works like a switch in this specific scenario. They have a lot of other modes. This really deserves having at least a one class entirely about transistors. Just know if you've got a pin that can't output enough current, there's almost always a way to upgrade that pin's capabilities using transistors to do whatever you were thinking of doing. Um, yeah, oh no. Okay, <laughs> I will try to hurry. So, relays are a mechanical device that works kind of like a transistor, but in this case, you energize a magnetic coil. It snaps a switch closed connecting a physical circuit. So it's similar to a reed switch, but instead of needing a magnet to close the circuit, you make your own magnet using electricity. Um, very helpful if you have a totally isolated electrical system that you don't want connected to your microcontroller. On to LED lights and light emitting diodes. So these can often be driven directly from your microcontroller pins or you can get them with controllers. You've all seen LED displays. Uh, Bash did a class where we all got a bunch of them just, what, half a month ago? Uh, come in single colors, visible, UV. They also come in non-visible, so UV and IR. Uh, you can make them blink, you can make them into signs, you can do whatever you want with them. There are display screens you can buy. There's so many types, I can't get into them all. Um, LCDs use opaque material to block light. LED panels can use thousands of tiny LEDs. So if you have an LED monitor, it's just literally 1920 by 1080 times four individual colored LEDs that output light and make up your pixels. E-ink displays are very similar to LCDs, but instead of blocking light passing through them, they decide which light gets reflected. Um, and they are also persistent on power off, so it's very good for low power applications. Some displays can only display certain things, like your typical old school seven segment displays can only display numbers because there are seven 
pixels essentially you can turn on and off that are bar shaped. Um, we've also got other visible outlet displays. There are Nixie tubes which were essentially filaments shaped like numbers that will phosphoresce in inert gases. You've got incandescent and fluorescent light bulbs. People used to use those a lot before LEDs became ubiquitous and better in every way. Now the only reason to do it is because you really, really want to for old school ladies style effects. Um, there are also ways you can do mechanical displays where you move physical things around to show what you want. So this number display on the side here just physically moves these orange pieces of wood to make a giant seven segment display. And there's crazy people who do super cool things like turn on magnets and move ferrofluid around to make a clock. So <laughs> that's super neat. And uh, yeah, um, there are also these analog meters. So before everything was digital, people would use what was called a galvanometer, which takes voltage and moves a magnetic shaft to a position based on the voltage it receives. So all your old school multimeters that use levers are galvanometers that uh, will move a bar. If you control the voltage sent to it, you can make it a display for whatever you want. You just change the label. So they can be cool things. Um, another use for galvanometers that's more modern and common is they can be made to move extremely fast. So if you put mirrors on the ends of them, you can shine a laser at them and it will move up and down and left to right fast enough to turn into a laser projector and display a whole image on the screen. You can get like 50,000 discrete movements per second. The, yeah, so if you want to make a laser light show, galvanometers are a good thing to look into. Buying them individually, they tend to be very expensive, though. So if you're looking at like $200 to get a pair that will take a laser in China places. On to motors. There are a variety of motors. You've got AC and DC motors, which will just turn when voltage is applied to their terminals. You've got stepper motors, which is a bunch of electromagnetic coils in a pattern around a magnetic shaft. Then you've got servo motors, which will receive feedback and move to a specific position or match a specific speed. And if the motor isn't doing it, it will adjust until it is. There are also vibration motors, where if you take a normal motor and put an off-center load on it, it will vibrate angrily. And that's how you get things in, what you call it, video game controllers and the like. So more on AC motors. Our DC motors usually come from like super small 1.5 volt motors designed to run on a battery and go all the way up to giant 48 volt commercial applications for weed whackers. AC motors are generally used only in high power applications like uh, rooftop air conditioning equipment and industrial things. There's not a ton of hobby AC motor usage. Um, DC motors can be controlled to reverse and go forward as well as their speed using a device called an H-bridge. You'll want to look into that. That again could be a whole class, but if you want to control a DC motor, H-bridge is the magic word. If you want to control an AC motor, you're going to want to build or buy a circuit called a VFD, which will allow you to control direction and speed similar to an H-bridge, but for AC. Uh, stepper motors, as I was mentioning, you've got a series of magnetic coils. If you energize one coil, the magnet in the motor shaft will snap to that position. Then you de-energize that and energize a second coil. The motor will step to the next one, and you can step it through all the coils around the motor by alternating which coil is active and which is not. There are stepper motor controllers that do a cool thing called micro-stepping. So instead of just turning one on and then the next, it will turn one on 1% or sorry, say like 12% of the time and the other one on 86% of the time. And by alternating that very quickly, the motor can move to additional steps instead of just the, say a normal stepper motor would have a hundred positions around the circle, the micro-stepping would allow you to have 1,600 positions around a circle. 
these are super common in 3D printers and yeah I'll keep going faster because I've taken too much of your time already we've got servo motors like I mentioned they are typically just a DC motor but they have added a sensor to them some servos are analog and will use potentiometers other ser uh, servos are digital and will use encoders or other position sensing methods maybe Hall effect sensors I'm it just depends on your servo. Essentially you can say I want the servo to move to this precise position and the servo will say I'm at this position and it will apply voltage until it gets to where you want it to go. They do have limits mostly the torque of the motor so the motor can try to get there but if it physically can't lift a 200 pound weight on its arm then it's never going to get there. So it depends you can get servos that are obscenely precise but for the price steppers as long as you don't exceed their torque ratings will be the cheaper way to get precision movements that's why everybody uses steppers on 3d printers because it's less expensive way to get more accurate movement Well, servo motors have a feedback loop. So the servo motor will know if it is not in its position and it will keep trying to correct that. Whereas a stepper motor, you can say move 500 steps and if something jams that shaft, it will send the pulses to move 500 steps, but the shaft may not have actually moved that far. The difference is the feedback where it is. Correct. Yeah, stepper motors do not have feedback intrinsically. You could turn a stepper motor into a servo, but if you've taken the time to pay for all the feedback mechanisms, a DC motor is cheaper than a stepper motor. So, it's a mixed bag. Depends on the motor you buy. In general, servos could be higher torque because DC motors are generally higher torque than steppers for the same rough size of the package. Good on servos. Okay, onward. There are linear motors out there. Almost always a linear motor is just a normal motor attached to something like a rack or a screw to generate linear motion. People do make direct drive linear motors, but they are super uncommon and very expensive. And unless you're a college student doing research, I've never seen any in the wild. So uh, nine times out of 10, Doing linear motion is going to cost you more one way or another, whether you're building your own rack and screw system or you're buying a pre-made one. It's just more parts to get a linear motion compared to a rotational motion. Uh, next topic is solenoids. These are devices with a wire coil that, ah, coil that generates an electromagnetic field. So you've typically got a metal shaft inside the coil and once you turn that coil on, the shaft will be magnetically charged and try to shoot itself out of the coil. Um, there's usually a stop on the end. If there isn't, then you built a railgun. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on the size of the magnetic field, it may or may not be dangerous. Usually isn't. Um, solenoids are typically used in things like your sprinkler valves. So when we go back to the moisture sensor example, if you determine that your garden is no longer moist, you can turn on a sprinkler valve using a solenoid and that will allow water to flow until your garden is moist once again. Um, you can also use them for like DIY instrument machines where you can shoot the solenoid into say a drum or a cymbal or a jar of rice and it'll make a sound for you. Um, essentially it's just a way to, they're not very good at fine movements but they're good at snap kind of pokey sharp movements on or off that's about all they're good for. Um, another output device is speakers or buzzers. So this changes voltage into vibrations. It's the opposite of a microphone or a piezo sensor where in physical reality they're basically the same thing but they have a different case around them that optimizes them for 
the use you're using them for. If you buy a speaker, you can use it as a microphone. It's just not as good at it as something that's physically designed to be a microphone. Um, you apply voltage, and this will cause the speaker to change shape. You almost always need a controller to do this because the you can't just hook a speaker up to a battery directly. You'll get one pop when it changes shape because the voltage changed once and then it's done. So you need to change it at the right frequency to hear a sound that's audible to you. Speakers tend to have a sound range they're designed to operate in. So if you send them frequencies outside of that range, they will physically tear themselves apart because they weren't expecting to work outside the range they're designed for. So keep an eye on that. You can use DACs directly to drive speakers, but typically you will take a DAC, feed it through an amplifier, and then attach that to a speaker. So, um, And there you can also buy these annoying little buzzers, which is a speaker with a simple circuit on it. So you just turn a digital pin on, and it makes a very annoying sound until you turn that pin back off. Uh, yeah. You and Sodar would get along. Um, yeah, so now we have reached near the end. So you can, the goal of this was just to give you an idea of the things that are out there and are possible. So you can connect as many sensors as you can think of for your project to a microcontroller and gather data about the real world. Then you can use that data and write code to interpret it and use all the outputs I discussed to send information back to the physical world and all that ties it together is a computer program. So if you're totally new to microcontrollers, you'll find on the internet everybody either loves or hates Arduino, but I think it is a great starting point for doing this kind of thing because it abstracts away the complexities of the compiler and the very low-level machine code and lets you jump straight into saying things like digital write this pin to high so you can turn on your LED without having to learn a lot of overhead that used to be required before Arduino took off. So that's my general recommendation for a starting point as far as what kind of platforms to run on. So are there any questions or have I bored you all? too much and you're ready to go to sleep. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question for uh, the internet. He's saying, when you've got your sensor information coming into the microcontroller and you write your code for it, how do you know what that information was and get feedback so you can debug it and decide what to do with the outputs? that about what you're going for? Okay, so the easiest way to do that on most microcontrollers is whatever interface you program them through, be it USB through a bootloader, which is typical for Arduinos, or either JTAG or I2C. You'll usually have the ability to write in your code a serial feedback that sends messages to your computer. So if you take an analog reading on a sensor, you can use a serial feedback over USB to your computer to essentially, you could say analog read this, store it as a value, and then you could print that value over serial to the computer so you can see on the monitor exactly what numbers you're getting from the sensor. And from there you can write code that if your moisture sensor drops below 128 out of 1024, you can apply this much water and then sleep until it's back down below 128, or however you want to handle it. Does that, I mean, serial's the most common way. You can also just, if this value changes to something, you can turn on an LED, so you have an indicator light on your board. You can, essentially any of those outputs, you could buy an LCD screen and print the messages to that directly. The, yeah. 
Correct. And if you've got so the Arduino environment doesn't have this, but a lot of ARM chips like STM32 will allow what's called hardware debugging, where if you have the programmer connected to it, you can actually look at the live memory registers on the chip and see exactly what data is stored where. That's more advanced and usually serial debug will get you most of the way there, but if it's an option, hardware debug can be very nice. Um, let's actually go to the internet because that's easier to see. Um, sorry, people on the internet, I just slapped the microphone. <laughs> so if you Google something like Arduino pinout and go here, you'll find one of these lovely diagrams. And I will make it embiggened. So you've got... Uh, this is a typical Arduino Uno. You can see here you've got pins down here labeled 1 through 13 and pins over here labeled A0 through A5. You'll note here that yellow says AVR. That means that it is connected to this AVR chip and typically instead of AVR, or yeah, so that's telling you on this AVR chip, if you look at the data sheet, this pin is connected to PD0 on this chip. Then where you see here where it says digital, those are pins that you can toggle on or off. So anything that has one of these blue, light blue circles is a digital pin. You'll note that all the pins labeled analog, A0 through A5, are also digital pins. You'll find very commonly that there are a lot of overlapping functions, so when you're selecting a chip, you want to make sure that if you need serial and SPI and I squared C that none of the pins are overlapping and you can actually use all the protocols at the same time on your chip. Um, you can see here where it says power, that's just uh, not actually necessarily connected to the microcontroller, it's just your ground and voltage Typically with microcontrollers, that'll come over USB. Then you've got serial here in orange. You've got SPI are these purple. You can see it says MISO and MOSI. That's the easiest way to pick them out, as well as SCK is your clock for that one. I squared C is the SDA and SCL. And then PWM pins that I mentioned where you can set fake analog outputs only apply to these six pins on an Arduino. So if you look in your data sheet, all of these terminologies from the communication protocols will show up in the data sheet and be tied to specific pins. And that's how you can find out what your microcontroller is doing. Yes, sir. So it, uh, his question was if the microcontroller already understands SPI and I squared C and again it always depends on the data sheet. If you buy a microcontroller pretty much any mi ah, modern microcontroller will support at least one or two communication protocols. Almost all of them support serial I squared C SPI at least one of those. So the way that works is with Arduino, pretty much any peripheral that the chip supports will have a library to support it. If you're doing STM32 ARM chips, bare board, whatever microcontroller manufacturer you buy them from will almost always have libraries that handle the protocols. You can write your own if you're unhappy with the ones that are provided, but most of the time you can just download a library, install it, and start using it because nobody wants to reinvent the wheel a hundred times and if it works, it works. So. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so he's asking if, so you want to use the bus pirate to program microcontrollers? Is that what you're trying to do or just Okay. 
Okay, uh, what something did you brick? Um, the Chinese version of the Proxmark 3. Proxmark 3 is bricked. Um, I am not familiar with how to I get a bootloader on a Proxmark. Yeah. <laughs> so Bash oh, knows yeah. Proxmarks like the back of his hand. If the Proxmark supports a communication protocol for programming that the bus pirate also supports, you could use the bus pirate to program it. So, in fact, if it's really brick, you have to use yeah, the there are some microcontrollers that will allow you to connect anything to a serial port and reprogram the chip from there. There are some that come with a hardware USB programming interface where you can plug something in, toggle a PIT to program mode, and then it will let you upload data over the USB port directly to the chip. Again, everything is very chip dependent, so in the case of a Proxmark, I don't know what it's running, and I can't give you a direct answer, but there's a good chance that a bus pirate will have some communication protocol that you can reflash the chip firmware with. Okay, yeah, so I'm pretty sure bus pirates can work with JTAG. JTAG is most likely what it'll be using if you're using ARM. Although if the pins aren't exposed, there may be a bootloader that just takes serial, which would be easier for the bus pirate. Okay, anything else? If you want to do anything that involves the internet, ESP8266 or ESP32, and the world is slowly switching to ARM-based chips. So I know there's a couple people here who prefer Atmel ARM. I've been learning uh, the STM32 that I keep mentioning. Those are made by ST, a uh, microcontroller company. The good thing about ARM is that the core command set works from one manufacturer to another. So once you learn the basics, you can port it fairly easily to other chip manufacturers. The bad thing about ARM is that every chip manufacturer implements their peripherals differently. Peripherals being the communication protocols we spend a whole lot of time talking about. So they will be using I squared C, but they may have a different manufacturer provided library for Atmel than the one you're using for your ST. So you'd have to swap them out and deal with the headaches that doing that causes. That's why typically when you're writing code, you've got what they call a HAL or hardware abstraction layer. And that essentially you take the manufacturer provided libraries and wrap it with a common set of send SPI command functions. So if you change manufacturers, you only need to update those send SPI functions to match the new manufacturer's library and the rest of your code will keep working. Because at its core, the communication protocols still flip the bits the same way. It's just how you tell them to do that that can change. Yep. So the magic word is pinout. So if I change Arduino in this Google search to Raspberry Pi, you will find a very similar diagram with pretty colors. Yeah, pin out is the magic word to find out what each pin does. So it has the analog and Yeah, I'm betting this one may not have been the best uh, picture to choose. Try again. Oh, there you go. That one says UART SPI I squared C. Um, Raspberry Pis, I believe they do have a couple analog pins, but they're pretty sketchy, and you're better off buying a daughter board that does that. You can probably make them work for some applications, but not for all. Or no, these are only analog inputs. I do not believe Raspberry Pis have an analog out other than its audio system on the board. And that one, I believe, is a daughter chip that's actually higher quality. So if you've got a robot and you want, oh sorry, he's asking what to use an ultrasonic sensor for other than annoying dogs and children. So if you have a robot and you want it to not drive into a wall, 
the ultrasonic sensor can say, hey, there's something in front of me, and you can tell it to stop. You could also use it for a motion detector. So if it's got a big cone of radius and something walks in front of it, it will alert you to that. Okay, any other questions? Hooray, thank you for coming to my hour-long rant. <laughs>